In the last few videos, we've been talking about linear models like this one from the famous Iris dataset, where we wanted to model how petal length depends on sepal length. We looked at this linear model to fit the curve we think we see in the data. The point is, linear doesn't mean straight line plots, it means linear algebra. Linear models are linear equations. We could say they're linear in the data. They're equations about vectors and each vector is a column in the data set. In this video, we're going to talk through some linear mathematics. This will all be abstract maths about vector spaces, not directly connected to data science. But doing all this abstract maths will help us understand more about linear models and especially how we should interpret their parameters, as we'll see in the next video. So, what do we need to know about linear maths? Here's a definition. The subspace spanned by a collection of vectors e1 up to ek, also known as the span of e1 up to ek, is the set of all linear combinations. So, what does this look like? Here are some arrows resting on the lawn of Trinity College Great Court. They're not allowed there because only fellows of the college are allowed on the lawn, so they'll soon be chased away by the college porters. Three of the arrows are in the plane of the lawn. If we add up appropriate amounts of these three, we can get anywhere in that plane. So the span of E1, E2, E3 is the horizontal plane. We don't need all of them, in fact. The span of, in fact, the span of E1, E3 is precisely the same plane, and indeed any two of them are enough. And the span of all four vectors is the entire 3D space. Let's just repeat that. We've said that by adding appropriate amounts of E1 and E3, we can get to anywhere in the horizontal plane of the lawn. In particular, we can get to E2. In this picture, it looks to me like E2 is equal to E1 plus E3. Or we could write it differently. E3 equals E2 minus E1. In other words, because we have three arrows spanning only two dimensions, we can always write one of them as a linear combination of the other two. In linear algebra, we say that a collection of vectors e1 up to ek is linearly dependent if there's at least one of them that can be written as a linear combination of the others. Or another way to write this is if there's some set of coefficients lambda 1 up to lambda k, not all equal to zero, such that the weighted sum lambda 1 e1 plus dot 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 plus lambda k e k is equal to zero. By the way, I'm writing vectors in brownie orange here. The e's are all vectors, and when you add up vectors, you get another vector. So the zero on the right hand side of the equation is the vector zero. Otherwise, these vectors are called linearly independent. If we have linearly independent vectors, and if some linear combination lambda 1 e1 plus, plus lambda k e k comes out to be 0, then the lambda coefficients must all be equal to 0. If you have a collection of vectors and you want to test if they're all linearly independent, these equations tell you what to do. You just write out the equation lambda 1 e1 plus, plus lambda k e k equals 0. You solve for lambda and you figure out from the maths if there's a non-zero solution. Or if you're at a computer, you can use a linear algebra routine called matrix rank after stacking all of your column vectors into a matrix. If the answer comes out less than k, then your vectors are linearly dependent Otherwise, the answer is equal to k and the vectors are linearly independent. You do have to watch out for floating point precision, of course. The algorithms are reasonably robust, but one day you'll be tearing your hair out trying to debug why this matrix rank gave you the wrong answer. And it'll be because a little bit of floating point error turned your vectors linearly independent. Let's work through an example. Are the following five vectors linearly independent? If not, find a subset that is. Well, just looking at these vectors, we can straight away see two linear relationships between them. 
e2 plus e3 is equal to e1 and also e4 plus e5 is equal to 1. So just taking this last equation we could write e5 as a linear combination of e1 and e4 and thus the span of e1 up to e5 must be the same as the span of e1 up to e4. The e5 is redundant. Likewise we could write e3 as a linear combination of e1 and e2 so we don't lose anything from the span if we get rid of e3. It was arbitrary which vectors I got rid of. I could have gotten rid of any of the vectors from the first equation and any of the vectors from the second equation. OK, so now I've reduced down to three vectors and the span is still the same as the original span. Let's test if these three are linearly independent. Well, all we have to do is we write down the equation for a linear relationship between them. Lambda e1 plus lambda e2 e2 plus lambda 4 e4 equals 0. Or, writing out the vectors in full, we get this. And we try and solve for the lambdas. Just taking the vector equations row by row. Lambda 1 plus lambda 4 equals 0. Lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 4 equals 0. Dot, dot, dot. In fact, the two middle rows of the vectors produce precisely the same equations. There's a redundancy there. We might as well have just deleted all, all of the rows where, where um, we've seen that row before. Solving these equations simultaneously, we get lambda 4 and lambda 2 are both equal to 0. So the only linear combination that adds up to 0 is where all of the lambda coefficients are equal to 0. And so by the definition of linear independence, e1, e2, e4 is a linearly independent set of vectors. Actually, there's a simpler answer to this question. Let's reread it. Are the following five vectors linearly independent? No, they're not. If not, find a subset that is. The question just asked us, find a subset of these vectors that's linearly independent. So a subset consisting of just one of them would have to be linearly in independent, of course. That's a technically correct answer. Technically correct is the best sort of correct. When we use linear independence in data science, though, we generally do want to get linearly independent vectors, but without reducing the span. So that's what we work through in this example. By now, you're surely asking, this algebra is all fine for someone who likes doing algebra, but what's the point? The answer is, if we have the right geometric intuition about vector spaces, we can understand what's going on with least squares estimation. Let me explain. Here's a picture of two vectors, e1 and e2, and their span, s. I've also drawn another vector, y, sticking out of the plane of s. A standard sort of question in geometry is, how close can we get to y while staying inside s? In this picture, I've labelled the closest point as y tilde and the distance as epsilon. Now, let's set that aside and talk a bit about least squares estimation for linear models. Remember, the idea is we have a set of features and we're looking at a linear model where the features are weighted by parameters that we want to estimate and we want to find the parameters that give the best approximation. The clincher is how we define closest and best. In vector spaces, there's an obvious definition of distance, the normal Euclidean distance formula. And in least squares, our goal has been minimize the mean square error. So now we can see that closest vector and best approximation are exactly the same thing. Least squares estimation is geometry. There's a definition I should mention here. In linear modeling, we'd call the space S the feature space. So now we can tie together the two threads that we've been talking about in this video. In the first half, we were talking about linear independence in a geometrical linear algebra sense. Let's link that, see what it has to say about least squares estimation and linear models. In least squares estimation, there's a question we haven't discussed yet, but it's really important if you ever want to report your results. 
When we run least squares estimation, does it always return the same parameter estimates? It's minimizing a function, that's what least squares estimation is, and when we minimize a function, we need to watch out for local minima. What if least squares estimation returns a minimum, and the next time we run it, we get a different minimum? For example, in the last video, we looked at climate data, and we pulled out an estimate that temperatures are increasing by a certain amount, 0.0354 degrees centigrade per year. What if someone else fits exactly the same data and gets a different answer because their computer found a different local minimum? Let's flip to the geometric view. In geometry, we could ask, is there a unique way to write y tilde as a linear combination of the vectors? This is what linear dependence is all about. If the features are linearly dependent, there might be multiple ways to add them together to get to y tilde. In other words, two different calls to the fitting routine might give back different parameter estimates. One more result I'll just mention. It's a bit harder to think through, so I'm just going to state the conclusion. Even if two different people do get different parameter estimates when they run the fitting routine, it's guaranteed that they'll get exactly the same predictions out of their model. As I said, I won't go into the maths behind this, but it does just drop out of all the linear algebra. In the next video, we'll look much more closely at this. We'll see how to write linear models to make sure that our features are linearly independent so that we get unique solutions for the parameters. 